Thank you for your time, Peter. Thanks for having me. There was some talk today about the TGA approving vaccines for those between 12 and 15. This is not only entirely off our radar at the moment in terms of priority, but I don't get the impression that kids are getting terribly sick and I certainly don't remember recalling a death in Australia. Now, overall, children, uh, luckily, are having much lower rates of infection than their parents or older Australians. And they also have much lower complication rates. In England, for instance, where this has been, you know, COVID has been going uncontrolled for, you know, 18 months, there is about 20 or 22 children that have died. Most of those have had underlying medical conditions, Down syndrome, neurological conditions. Mm. So it's very uncommon for a child to die, uh, anybody under the age of 18, from COVID. Now, it's not that they can't get it and can spread it, it's just they're much lower risk. So with any vaccination campaign, they are much lower down the order of who should receive a vaccine than 50-year-olds, for instance, who are a higher priority than 30-year-olds. So I don't think we should rush and, uh, and vaccinate uh, children or teenagers. If you've got an underlying health condition, yes, that gives you a different priority. But for the vast majority of teenagers, we should wait till probably the end of the year when we will have enough vaccine and we'll also have more data on how safe it is and how effective it is. Because you've got to remember in the US, for instance, where the Pfizer vaccine has mainly been rolled out, there are children, mainly male teenagers, who get an inflammation of the heart called myocarditis. Now, it seems reversible in most of them are mild, but again, it's worth having more data before we roll out a vaccine to what is, a, at the moment, a low-risk group compared to those who are older than them. OK, something of greater priority and significance is today the Chief Health Officer in New South Wales calling a national emergency because of what's happening in southwestern Sydney. Is the answer, as they tried to convince us today, to get as many people in the southwest of Sydney vaccinated and even the National Cabinet redirecting Pfizer doses to that area? Well, I think we do need to send more vaccines where there's an outbreak, and that actually happened in Melbourne, you know, a couple of months ago. But vaccines take a while to work. If I have an injection today, there's, you know, 10 days to two weeks before my antibodies go up and my white cells really respond. And it's really 10 days to two weeks after your second dose. And with Pfizer, if it's three weeks apart, that means five weeks from your first dose. So that's a good idea, particularly if you think, uh, you know, uh, a spread can go on for longer than you're anticipating at the moment. But equally, we could have a problem in Perth next week or Queensland two weeks later. So while, yes, send some more vaccine to areas that have got outbreaks at the moment, we still need to make sure that it goes generally to all the areas around Australia based on population, because this is a medium to long term problem we've got. And we've got to make sure we send the vaccines so that everybody gets access, access to it in a reasonably equitable way. If you look at the venues, the alert venues that come out each and every day, I'm seeing more pharmacies, more supermarkets being where those who are COVID uh, positive have been and it's being transmitted in those areas. That snookers, it's, snookers us so much, doesn't it? Because those places can't close. We need food. We need uh, pharmaceuticals. And so, so, to some degree, we've got to allow Delta, I guess, to win in those scenarios. Do we do that? Well, so far in Australia, every time we've had an outbreak, eventually we've controlled it and, in fact, eliminated the virus. And it'd be nice if we could do that again. But you've got to remember, if you look at Melbourne last year, but, in fact, what's happening in Sydney, um, essential workers are the ones who mainly are getting infection and spreading it, not only in the workplace to each other and sometimes to customers, but also when they bring it back to their homes. So there is an inevitability that you can't lock everybody, including essential workers, in their home. There is a risk with who you're allowed to move, and some people you can just not stop moving, you know, mm. nurses, doctors, but cleaners, people who work in supermarkets, industries we just can't close down. We need to do everything we can to minimise that, and some of the places that have occurred, I think, gather both now and before, uh, you know, um, tea rooms, um, handover rooms. We're going to make sure the four square metre rule is kept. Masks are on. For lunch or morning tea, go outside and have it rather than, you know, be in a tea room with, with others where you give it to each other. Don't carpool. Try and get transport by yourself. All those sort of things make a difference. And particularly anybody with symptoms, do not go to work. And if you're at home, try and keep your distance from your family because still you get the impression some of the people transmitting these infections have been unwell for three, four, five days and are still continuing work, for instance. I want to get your view on that UK graph that I showed viewers at the start. Um, 
I know we're hearing from Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, that 40% of those who are turning up in hospitals have been vaccinated. They've had the full vaccination treatment. But we are seeing how vaccination works in terms of the number of deaths reported in the UK, right? We are. That's why you've got to be careful of just not looking at percentages. You've got to look at absolute numbers as well. Whichever way you look at it, the, the absolute numbers of people, particularly older people, is decreasing. And that's the effect of the vaccine. We know the vaccine, including for all variants, including the Delta one, um, two doses of Pfizer or AstraZeneca are equally protective against hospitalisation, 92 94% um, in the real world data rather than trials and probably 98% plus it's stopping you dying. But that doesn't mean you get 100% protection. So perversely, the more vaccines you give out, you will still see people fully vaccinated who come into hospital, but tenfold less in absolute numbers than before. But also, you'll see proportionally more and more young people coming into hospital because the vaccines work in the people who've had it most, which are older people. So you can get these distortions because the vaccine is actually working that makes it look, oh, maybe it's not as good as it should be. But the vaccines on all the available data are very good at stopping you dying and very good at stopping you getting into hospital. Uh, great advice. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Professor Peter Collignon.